Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, and welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm J.P. Clark, Deputy Director for Academic Engagement at the Strategic Studies Institute and a War Room Senior Editor. At the U.S. Army War College, we have different departments teach defense management, which essentially is the creation and sustaining of forces with the right kinds of technology in order for them to be successful, and then actually the employment of those forces through military strategy and campaigning. Outside of the schoolhouse, however, hopefully those things actually work in tandem and are not divided. In the first half of the 20th century, the U.S. Navy's general board did precisely that by combining what we could call the strands of institutional strategy and operational strategy in a single body. Our guide to the general board today is Dr. John T. Kuhn, professor of military history at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College and the author of several books, including America's First General Staff, A Short History to the Rise and Fall of the General Board of the Navy, 1900 to 1950. Dr. Kuhn is also a retired naval flight officer who specialized in electronic warfare and technical intelligence in his 23-year career. John, thank you very much for being here. Thanks, JP. All right, so let's begin by providing the listeners with uh, some basic background. What was the General Board of the Navy, and why was it initially founded? Okay, the General Board of the Navy was uh, established in 1900 by Secretary of the Navy John D. Long, um, who was William McKinley's Secretary of the Navy. The reason for its establishment uh, was there were these naval reformers who had been agitating, is probably the best word for it, for the Naval Officer Corps, particularly the senior officers in the Navy, to have more of a role in how the Navy was employed strategically, uh, if not operationally. Um, you know, the, Na- the, the in past wars, the, the secretaries of the Navy had sort of retained that to, to themselves and then sort of sent the ships out. And, and so strategy had been a very ad hoc thing. And so after the Civil War, uh, a group of reformers uh, agitated for reforms. And uh, there was a board established. This is something that was sort of standard in British practice, and the Americans did the same thing to solve a specific problem. And the specific problem was there were a number of specific problems, you know, how to integrate the new steam and steel warships, uh, into the structure of the Navy, but also uh, the Navy wanted to establish a Naval War College. And so a board met, and uh, one of the results of that was the uh, creation and establishment of the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, the first president being uh, Admiral Luce. And uh, Mahan was a part of this group. But what they did was they kind of hid the war planning strategy function that they wanted inside the Naval War College. So they started working on the creation of war plans and studying war plans at the same time as educating strategic leaders in the Naval War College. Um, and the guy who really kind of gets most of the credit for this was the guy who relieved Luce. In fact, Luce was already gone when he showed up, and that was his uh, was uh, Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan. And so Mahan usually gets a lot of credit for that, but uh, his successors uh, kind of followed in his footsteps doing that. Well, in the Spanish-American War, the Navy had kind of not been pleased with how everything performed. I mean, they were happy that they had, you know, a, a, a sort of a modern fleet, and they were had sort of this pre-dreadnought fleet that they had. Uh, they had uh, Secretary Long had kind of given in to uh, to Luce and Mahan and these others, and established something called the War Strategy Board. But it was an ad hoc board that was created. It wasn't a permanent board. And they had actually run the naval operations of the Navy in the Spanish-American War. And this board was actually seen as a success. So the Navy wanted to kind of, Long and the admirals in the Navy, particularly George Dewey, the hero of Manila Bay, wanted to capitalize on this. And Dewey actually had his protege, uh, Captain uh, Henry Clay Taylor, write up a memorandum for the establishment of a naval general staff modeled on the German general staff for Long. Well, Long took this memorandum and decided what he was going to establish was not a general staff, but a much smaller body, and that became the General Board of the Navy. And its charter was established by Navy General Order, I think it was General Order 540 or 544. It was established in 1900, and it established a General Board of the Navy to sort of look at 
uh, preparation of the Navy uh, for the defense of maritime uh, security and for the coasts. So it was a real simple charter, but it was not established in law, it was not established in code by Congress. It was essentially an experiment to establish sort of an experimental Navy general staff, but not call it a Navy general staff because of the concerns over creeping Prussian militarism. And one of the amazing things that uh, you bring out so nicely in the book, um, and uh, even though you had, you just you know mentioned it, I think a lot of our listeners who are used to the modern Pentagon and you know the the, the lo- lumbering you know staffs of you know hundreds and thousands between the service staffs and the joint staff and everything else like that. So the Naval Strategy Board during the Spanish American War w- was really down to about four or five skill players at, at, at one point where everybody had kind of, you know, gone off to war. And so it was just a, a, a really just a, a handful of people. Yeah, there were only three people in it, and really. Then, I mean, yeah. I mean, there were at one a point. A secretary and a, yeah, some assistants, yeah, they, yeah. But, yeah, so, but the three the three main people were Captain Mahan, uh, I, I don't know if he was an admiral yet, Captain Crown and Shield, and there, were, there was one other person. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, as assistant secretary of the Navy, had been on the board, but he left. And he wasn't really replaced uh, at all because he remained Assistant Secretary of the Navy while he was Colonel of the Rough Riders. So there were, normally it would have been the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, but uh, instead it was uh, another captain. I'm, I, I'm trying to remember the other captain who was on the board. Uh, the membership changed. Uh, there were a couple new general orders that came out that changed the membership of the general board. But, but yeah, you're right. Uh, it established sort of an intern program for junior officers. Uh, some of these junior officers... Uh, uh, we're almost when you read the book, you, they, they're almost like coup plotters. They're trying to they're trying to use the general board as a vehicle to kind of create a Prussian naval general staff. Uh, and th- and their sea daddy is this guy Bradley Fisk, who's who's trying to who really wants to create an uh, an official naval general staff. He's not he thinks that the general board is sort of a weak wishy washy general board light, and he wants a bigger general board. So does Loose, by the way. Uh, Taylor, on the other hand, is like, no, this is pretty good. Um, and so it's a very small thing. Uh, their main charter is war planning, uh, is preparation of the fleet to defend the United States. And it's fascinating, you, you, in the book, you, you lay out some of the things that they're looking at. And so some of these are very large strategic issues, some kind of neck down into the much more tactical, like, you know, how do we defend and what's the fortifications for a coaling station? Although all of them have some pretty large, you know, implications depending upon how you're going to do it. But it's from very focused uh, studies, and you had mentioned some of the junior officers who are are, are coming in, and, and uh, many of us can can empathize with this, that when you had a lot of these junior non-voting members, where the number of studies tended to go up, because, <laughs> you know, the, the seniors were, were, were working the dog out of these, these young people who are producing, you know, tons of studies, but getting a chance to understand the, the strategic and policy uh, uh, landscape. Now, Moving forward a little bit to the establishment of the <laughs> uh, the chief of naval operations, right? And so there's a little kind of confusion within you know the history about this. You know, what does it mean for the general board? So so how does the CNO come into this, and and why is it a little bit more nuanced than a lot of people have remembered? That well, CNO comes in and general board starts going down is essentially the oversimplistic story that's been told up to now. Right, and, and, and my work is revisionist in that regard. So, so, you know, there's still this faction of officers inside the Navy, and one of them is a member of the general board, is, is Bradley Fisk. He's, he's sort of, he's basically Dewey's, Dewey's chief of staff for operations and chief of staff. So he kind of combines the, the, the functions of a chief of staff and an N3 or an op, ops officer in, in one function. But he wants a naval general staff. They, he doesn't think the gen, he thinks the general board's fine for the policy level, but he thinks you need a more a more a larger, more more uh, more efficient staff to to develop war plans and and create war planning for the, the uses of the United States Navy in war. So he bypasses Admiral Dewey, who's the president of the general board and the secretary of the Navy goes directly to Congress and gets legislation passed to create a chief of naval operations. Uh, also, part of this move is to create the Naval Reserve, by the way. So that's so another thing. And by the way, that, the general board had been recommending that for years. 
But the CNO is sort of Admiral Fisk's uh, uh, own little brainchild, and his plan is for him to be the first chief of naval operations. He thinks, as sort of the ops officer for Dewey and for uh, Josephus Daniels, that he'll get appointed. What happens is Daniels will not appoint Fisk to be the first chief of naval operations. He'll grab uh, the head of one of the Navy Yards, a guy named William S. Benson, Captain Benson, and promote him essentially over the heads of dozens of other captains and admirals to be the first chief of naval operations. Benson will at first be on the general board as the CNO. Uh, eventually, he'll get his own offices and everything, but he is a statutory member of the general board, so that's in the law, that's written, and so he is a member of the general board by virtue of this. Initially, he doesn't have hardly anybody working for him, so when we think of the you know, CNO today, we think of thousands and thousands of people inside the Pentagon working for OPNAV. But at the time, Benson's staff was extremely small. Uh, he didn't even get the war planning function right away. That is created, and eventually what happens is that the Chief of Naval Operations and his planning staff, OPNAV, will be augmented over time, and they will get, by 1917, by the time the United States enters World War I, they will get the war planning portfolios. The General Board will still be advisory on war planning, but their main job will be policy advice to the Secretary of the Navy, particularly on fleet design and warship design. So those functions will migrate away. The General Board will no longer be a primarily a war planning organization. They'll still provide advice. They'll still review war plans. But the, but the final war plans will be finalized under the Chief of Naval Operations. Well, one of the, the, the great parts of the book, uh, especially for a lot of our you know, Marine Corps listeners out there also, is where sometimes there's Marine Corps representation, sometimes they're not, and how that kind of shapes uh, some of these. Uh, I forgot that. Yeah, the Commandant of the Marine Corps is also a member of the General Board. And uh, it kind of, you, you can plot the, uh, the relative uh, uh, relationships within the, the Department of the Navy by whether there's a Marine Corps representative or not in the board, but certainly uh, you make a very good case that, that the thinking gets better when you have some more of these views right. uh, within yeah, the small I, I group. Yeah, I think uh, when the Marine when the Commandant of the Marine Corps uh, 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 loses his seat on the General Board, I think that's a loss. Yeah. Now, so moving ahead to uh, the post-war uh, era, and so this is a fascinating time in terms of strategy because clearly uh, we have uh, several large combatants from World War I are exhausted. Uh, everybody is trying to figure out where they're going to be in the world. Uh, certainly, the United States. You have an intersection of domestic politics. Is you know should, should to Versailles or not to Versailles? That is the question, and whether we want to be part of the League of Nations. Um, uh, and but then also there are some very interesting military technical problems. You know, the the submarine was a shock to to many. The role that it played, aviation, the, the huge. Uh, leaps from 1914 to 1918, but there's still a lot more to come from aviation. And where exactly is that going to go? There are so many problems, both you know, strategic and uh, the policy realm and tactical, uh, for everybody to figure out. Not just the U.S., not just the Navy. And it seems that there's a seminal moment for the General Board in 1922 with the the Washington Naval Treaty. So. Tell us a little bit about how there's this intersection of fleet design and so the institutional strategy with the, the, the really the national policy and grand strategy of how, how should the U.S. position itself in relation to you know, the United Kingdom and Japan? Well, one of the so-called lessons learned of World War I is that, you know, is that arms races, and, and particularly the naval arms race between Germany and Great Britain, caused a war. The, the fascinating thing is with the end of World War I, the arms race didn't end. And uh, the three, vic three of the victorious powers are the three, only three naval, uh, major naval powers left. Uh, actually, there's five. There's France, Italy, Japan, the United States, and Great Britain. But the United States and Great Britain um, and Japan, by far and away, are, are the major naval powers. Uh, so... The arms race doesn't end, and for Great Britain, the United States, and Japan, this is this is this is bad news. They all want to realize a peace dividend, but they can't. Their naval officer corps are telling them, "No, we've got to keep building." The, the Americans have this huge building plan. The British 
you know, are trying to keep up with the Americans because that's how it is now after World War I. And the Japanese are trying to keep their fleet uh, in a position with the so-called 8-8 eight, eight plan, 8 battleships, 8 battle cruisers, so that they can maintain some mod modicum of, of capability against the Americans. So, so what happens coming out of, uh, out of World War I is, is uh, uh, that, the that, the, that the United States new administration under Warren G. Harding invites all the major powers to Washington in, in 1921, November 1921. And the conference goes from 1921 into the, into the early part of 1922. And then the, the several treaties come out, but the one that concerns us here is the Washington Naval Treaty, which sets a 5-5-3 ratio between the United States, the United Kingdom, and, uh, and, J and Japan. So, so this is a seminal moment uh, for the general board because uh, the general board has asked for its advice on, on policy for this con naval conference. Um, and they're actually against the 5-5-3 ratio. So the Secretary of State actually goes against their advice and, 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 and sort of preempts them with, with the 5-5-3 plan. So this is a shock to the Navy and to the general board that, uh, that the United States signs this naval treaty which is going to scrap a million tons of capital ship shipping. Uh, you know, you already talked about the shock of, shock of the submarine in World War I. The, Navy, the Washington Conference is supposed to deal with the submarine. What do we do about the submarine? How do we get it back in the box? Uh, the other shock prior to the Washington Naval Conference is the sinking of the Ostfriesland by Billy Mitchell. And so how are we gonna deal with this new technology and everything? And so what happens is after the, after the conference is over, the general board is presented with a fait accompli. Uh, that fait accompli is one, battleship building holiday. There will be no capital ships built for 10 years. So right off the bat, the battleship is sort of a dead end for naval design and solving what you see as your naval problems, all right? Uh, secondly, what can you build? You are allowed to build aircraft carriers, but again, the ratio is going to be 553 between the Americans, the British, and the Japanese. So it forces the navies of the world, particularly the United States Navy, into, into coming up with innovative ways around the treaty. And who gets the charge of all of this? The general board does. Basically, after the treaty is signed, the president and the secretary of the Navy turn to the general board and say, it's your job to implement the provisions of the Washington Naval Treaty in the United States Navy. Now, initially, they see this as constraining the Navy. I argue this is good because it forces the general board to think differently. It forces the Naval Officer Corps to think differently about how to solve its primary strategic problems. And I'll talk about what it sees as its primary strategic problem in a second. But it does constrain them. But so to paraphrase uh, Churchill, gentlemen, we're out of money and we have a force gap. Now it's time to now think. Now it's time to think. And this is true not just for the United States Navy, but also for the Japanese and the British. And the Americans and the Japanese actually do a pretty good job innovating based on these constraints. Uh, the other thing that limits the Navy by the Washington Treaty is something called the Fortification Clause. It limits the Navy's ability to build up bases in the Far East. That's because the Japanese only agree to sign the treaty if we'll agree to the Fortification Clause. So Admiral Kato Tomasaburo, who is the Japanese chief delegate to the conference, who's also the Navy minister and later becomes the, the prime minister, all while on active duty in the Navy, uh, he agrees to this, but he says the United States will not be able to, to put its ships into dry dock and into bases in the Far East. And that way, the United States Navy will be limited in the efficiency of its fleet when it gets to the Western Pacific. So this is also going to force the general board and the Navy to think, well, how can we fight in the distant Pacific without bases? You can't. And just to remind our, our listeners, we're, you know, at this point, we have a lot of forces in the Philippines. And so that is the big strategic problem for both yeah, the Army for, and the Navy. You know, if you can't fortify, can you actually, or even if you can fortify, can you really defend the Philippines versus Japan being so close and this is a central dilemma that everybody wrestles with. Right. And previous th to this, the, the solution in, in uh, the colored uh, war plan, war plan orange, was to fortify Guam and to fortify Subic Bay, create dry docks there, sail the Navy across to Guam at least, and maybe uh, to the Philippines, uh, uh, and then do upkeep of the ships in the Far East. And then if you have to fight the Japanese to protect the Philippines, you can do it from there. At the very least, you might be able to rescue the Philippines. 
Um, this war plan orange takes on a life of its own. The great book on this is Edward Miller's book called War Plan Orange. Um, and this shapes the Navy's thinking, and particularly the general board's thinking about how do we build the Navy to do this? And a couple things that they realize is, one, we can still build airplanes. So the, the general board is pushed into towards almost being air-minded by the Washington Naval Treaty, as is the rest of the Naval Officer Corps. Uh, there's no limitations on submarines. We're limited in, in the numbers of cruisers we can build and, and how big they are. Eventually, the 1930 London Naval Treaty will limit cruisers. So we can actually build, build, build submarines. Maybe we can build floating dry docks, oilers, and eventually what the Navy comes up with, and this is the general board that comes up with this plan in concert with the CNO and the Naval War College, which is wargaming these, these things, and the fleet, which is wargaming them in the fleet problems every year, is we're going to build a long-range Navy that doesn't need shore bases in the Western Pacific. They will sail across, capture the bases they need, and they'll bring their bases with them. And this is called the Mobile Base Project. And the general board is entirely on board, pun intended, to, to kind of create this plan. So this, this strategy that's dictated by the geography of the Pacific causes the general board to create a long-range navy. Um, but it's a long-range navy that's going to, you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to, it's not going to be able to sort of sortie all the battleships at once and win the decisive sort of Mahanian victory. It's going to have to conduct a methodical step-by-step -step advance across the Pacific, creating bases, bringing floating bases with it. Floating dry docks become a primary item in their in the general board building priorities that it submits to the Secretary of the Navy every year. Building that Navy is actually going to build the Navy that's needed for World War II. Okay, now will that Navy be built when World War II arrives? No, but the plans, the blueprints, the strategic design will already be there, and the general board, along with the Chief of Naval Operations and the Naval War College, will, should really get the credit for having that plan in place and the designs and everything all worked out prior to the start of the war. Well, one thing you bring out very nicely in the book is the, the, that these... People, they, once they got to the senior levels of the general board, you know, they probably have been associated with it, you know, a couple times. Uh, as you said, maybe they, they're, they're simply, you know, taking part in the hearings, but some have done multiple tours uh, or they've, you know, gone through Newport and the Naval War College and been, you know, the, the key of this work. So you really have a small group of very uh, talented individuals. This is a, a stepping stone to be able to do some of this. This is your shore duty. Uh, and they're going to uh, have a shared understanding of, of, of where they need to go later on. What, what are some of the other elements of, that you think make the, uh, what's the secret sauce of the general board that they do such a good job of creating a, a coherent institutional and operational plan that, that are, for the most part, borne out by, by experience during World War II? Okay, so it's small. It stays small, okay? Smaller organizations are more effective organizations, all right? Anytime bureaucracy uh, grows, uh, organizational friction is introduced into the, into the machine, all right? You know, that becomes the ghosts in the machine, as it were. So, so it stays small. It works for the Secretary of the Navy. You've already mentioned the membership. The membership are seasoned operators. These are proven, proven performers. So they're very experienced, they're collaborative, not just with each other, but with the guys up at the Naval War College, with the guys inside the War Plans Division, they work very closely with the engineers. Eventually, everybody realizes, hey, the general board, if they don't buy into it, it's not gonna happen. So they all are empowered um, and they all play the game knowing that the general board sort of controls the final decision. And so they all work towards the same end. So collaborative and collegial. The tone here is really good. The, the, when you read the correspondence, uh, it, there's not, uh, you know, hey, this is Admiral Bristol, you know, Captain so-and-so, do this. No, it's, it's, it's my dear Yarnell or my dear Bristol. And so very collegial. The junior officers that work for the board love working for it because they kind of get to hang around the admirals and see what it's like to work for an admiral. You you touched briefly upon it before that this was an experiment that Long, who is a reformist secretary, is he's one of you know the better secretaries uh, of the Navy of, of that time, but yet he was a little bit wary about giving too much power to some of the military 
uh, both for our own American traditions as well as fears of, you know, Prussianification, as you had mentioned. But over time, you know, the general board is recognized, not in uh, uh, you know, authorizing legislation, but in some of the, the, the appropriations. And so it really earns the trust of civilian policymakers, which is what enables it to have this kind of authority and heft. You discuss in the book, you know, originally this is this all kind of embodied in Dewey. Yeah. Where he was this huge national hero. He had an immense amount of gravitas and influence. And he, But he gives that over to the general board. But the general board in time earns that trust on its own. Civil-military relations is, is so essential to both institutional and operational strategy. So one final thing that I would ask for, for you to give to our listeners is, what are your thoughts about how does the military earn that kind of trust that they can have this sort of authority that the, the, the general board had at its peak? Throughout the general board's early history, you, you constantly see it. We don't want to push too hard for a naval general staff because disaster could happen and, and we could end up with nothing. All right. It's better to have this general board that, that the civilians are comfortable with, that's not in your face, you know, uh, in a uniform with a bunch of medals and swords like the Prussian general staff is. It's better. That's better than, you know, Bradley Fisk, you know, wanting a naval general staff and we're all going to wear swords and uniforms. And, and he scares people. He scares Daniels. Um, and, and, and actually, the, some of the historians that have looked at it, he scares them too. But uh, so we don't want to ruin it. We don't want to undo all the goodness. And, and so by the time we get to the 20s and the 30s, you know, they are trusted. Um, but that never leaves them. The fact that, hey, if we... If we don't, if we don't, if we're not professional about this, if we don't defer to civilian authority, uh, like when they go into the wash, into the White House, uh, President Hoover invites them over to the White House, and he says, "You are going to solve this problem of something called the cruiser yardstick." And if you want to know what that is, read the book. But uh, you're going to solve, or read Norman Friedman's work. You're going to solve this problem. He feels comfortable enough to invite them over there, and they don't all go over there and pound on the table with their shoe or something and tell them, this is what we want, Mr. President. They work with the president, they compromise, and they gain his trust. They gain the trust of the secretaries of the Navy. You know, one interesting aspect on the trust, the original design for the chief of staff of the Army was they wanted to tie uh, the chief's tenure to that of the president. So there was somebody who always had... Mm -hmm. The president's ear, which right. is an, it would be an interesting change if we could make it to now. It's you know the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is the equivalent, but you know that's how much that Elihu Root realized that you know you had to have the trust between the the, the principal military advisor and the advised. Right, um, and this is this is the the big problem with the American system. It's and it's a good big problem, folks. It's a really good problem, but but it is a problem, and that is the president's. Uh, by statute, have these advisors, a, a secretary of defense and a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff now with Goldwater Nichols, who is the military advisor to the president, they don't have to listen to them. He has a national security advisor. He doesn't have to listen to him either, all right? So so presidents, it says nowhere that, oh, not only do you have, you, you know, not only do you have these advisors, but you have to take their advice. Uh, the great thing about the general board is that, that the, a lot of the policymakers did take their advice. They not only listened to them, they took their advice. Well, this has been a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, there are plenty of, uh, of other bits in the book that I think that uh, hopefully our listeners become readers and they enjoy it. Uh, we talked about how kind of accidentally the general board gained all this trust. One of the great elements for all of those people interested in, in organizational reform is that one of the, the great efforts to try to make the general board better actually might have ended, you know, end up kind of, you know, taking away from it. So all of that and plenty more within the book, America's First General Staff uh, by Dr. John T. Kuhn. Thank you so much for, for coming out and visiting us in the war room. Thank you, JP. It's a pleasure. If you've enjoyed this podcast and want to hear even more great content, subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. 
Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.